السلام عليكم ورحمة everyone to our webinar and conventional lessons for tight wheel reservoirs. At first, I will do five minutes presentation about reservoir solutions company. Reservoir solutions company, the company specializes in providing technical studies and courses for oil and gas companies and professionals. The company incorporates many professionals with diverse technical background related to oil and gas exploration and production. Our services, we can provide technical reservoir studies, field development planning, reservoir static and dynamic modeling, economic feasibility studies for projects, technical support, in case of academic resources for PhD and master degrees, assisting in writing technical papers and publishing, technical petroleum courses by industry experts. Also, we provide mentorship programs. For our next course of production optimization, it will be seven days hands-on workshop. The topics that will be covered during the course. The course will cover reservoir performance for the IPR and the VLB. Also the predicting future IPR and VLB for the wheel. Multi-layer modeling for vertical lift performance. Also flow equation for single phase, wheel flow correlation and other interesting topics. Also, you after completing the course, you will able to perform perforation design, calculate the skin into your will, and also do sensitivity analysis and prediction. Also, you will be able to design the artificial lift that's suitable for your will, like the e-speed design and also gas lift design. In case you wanted to enroll into this course, the course fees is only 50 USD for professionals and about 30 USD for students. I will send the uh, registration link into the Zoom chat. For our course, for our webinar today, that will be instructed by the engineer Vladimir Putin. Engineer Vladimir Putin, graduated from the Colorado School of Mines with PSC and master degree in petroleum engineering. A thesis was in what the relationship between porosity and permeability change under stress indicates about rock structure. He has since been working at NITIC LLC in Denver, Colorado. He has done numerous numerical simulation projects for unconventional plays conventional reservoirs and gas storage fields. For our webinar rules, please ask your question into the Zoom chat, mute your microphone and camera. In case you wanted to get a certificate for this webinar, please fill in the form that will be sent into the Zoom chat. Join, join our Telegram channel for upcoming webinars and courses and also the link will be sent into the Zoom chat. Thank you all. And engineer uh, Vladimir, you can start sharing your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Can everybody see it okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to discuss lessons from unconventional plays that we can be, be applied to uh, tight oil development. I wrote this presentation with a Middle Eastern audience in mind, so it'll go into a lot of the basics of unconventional plays and how we've developed them, but not in a um, in-depth way, because that's not the point of the presentation, and that would take much longer than we have. So conventional versus uh, conventional tight versus and conventional how to adapt learns from what's the other. So first we have to discuss what the main, what unconventional play is. 
Um, U.S. unconventional resources are called plays instead of reservoirs typically because they do not they do not have trap mechanisms like a conventional reservoir would. Uh, unconventional plays are the source rock, and the low permeability of that source rock keeps oil contained. It doesn't have a cap rock. It doesn't have a salt dome. Uh, whatever trap mechanisms you're used to in a conventional reservoir don't apply with unconventional uh, plays. So the reason we have to hydraulically fracture unconventional reservoirs is to expose as much rock face as possible to the well bore, because otherwise these plays would not produce. Over geologic time, these plays do slowly, unconventional plays do slowly seep oil upwards, and that seepage upwards does form conventional reservoirs, but uh, these plays are not those. And if you look at the permeability regimes, it, it's really becomes clear how bad it is. Uh, conventional oil and gas is, has permeability above one millidarcy, while shale oil and gas has permeabilities uh, three to six orders of magnitude less. Uh, tight oil will fall between these, but it's much closer. Tight oil tends to be much closer to conventional oil and gas. <clears throat> so, when we talk about what is the driving mechanism, what is the drive force of unconventional reservoirs, uh, it is just solution gas drive or depletion drive. The compressibility of the oil and the gas and the rock is all there is to produce the oil out of the ground. There can't be any aquifer support because the permeability is way too low for that. Their initial pressures are far above bubble point. Uh, and there's really not enough permeability to segregate the fluids, even if that wasn't true. So there's no possibility of a gas cap. So all you have is depletion drive. However, in terms of depletion drive reservoirs, unconventionals have several things going for them. They have a very high initial pressure. So when you look at the Eagleford, the PSI per foot gradient of those reservoirs is 0.9. If you look at the Permian, it's 0.6. Uh, the Bakken is between those two. This oil is very light. It's, it's, it's uh, low density. It has a low viscosity. And there's a huge gap between the initial pressure and the bubble point pressure. So if your initial reservoir pressure is 6,000 pounds and your bubble point pressure is 3,000 pounds, that's a huge amount of time you're able to produce this uh, oil before gas starts forming. And even when gas does start forming, the rock is so tight that the critical gas saturation is effectively relatively high. So from a perspective of what makes a solution gas drive reservoir work, the recovery factors you get from unconventionals end up very high. If you've ever done a Tarner Tracy model or any other type of material balance and you stick these properties into it, the recovery factors are on the high end or a solution uh, gas drive. But it's so low permeability that we need to create hydraulic fractures in order to produce it. So that very tight matrix rock with less than 0 0.01 millidarcy, in some cases far less, can't go to the wellbore directly. It has to first travel through the hydraulic fractures we make or whatever natural fractures exist to get to the wellbore. Uh, now, tensile fractures alone the kind of bi-wing fractures you see in uh, a lot of images aren't enough to do this because if the rock is more than a couple feet away from the tensile fracture, it can't travel that far uh, within the time frames we're dealing with in, in terms of years. So it needs complex fractures. And then from those complex fractures, it can take those the short distance to the tensile fractures and then the tensile fractures will act as the pathway to the well bore. So if you think of it as a city, uh, you have your apartment building, is, your apartment is the matrix. You take the hallways through your apartment to get to the street and those uh, walkways between in your apartment are the complex fractures. And then the street is the tensile fracture. And then the street takes you to the highway, which is gonna be your well bore to wherever you're going. Okay. So basically you need complex fractures in this system in order to expose surface area in order to produce. So 
uh, if that's confusing, don't worry, we're going to talk about it a lot more. Uh, so in here on the left side, you have we have a simulation in which we did tensile dominated failure. And on the right side, we have shear dominated failure. So simple bi-wing fractures on the left and then complex fractures on the right. Uh, now, when we're looking at tensile failures, they're dilation based. The fractures are opening up. There is a uh, lot of relatively high amount of pore volume being created in that fracture. It, these are very conductive failures when you're talking about bi-wing tensile failures, very high conductivity, but they do not provide very much surface area. It just is a crack. It, it's not much surface area with the rock. And also because it is dilating open because of the hydraulic fracturing process, once pressure is depleting, the what are those red lines? Once the pressure is depleting, uh, these will close right back up again. Now, when we're looking at shear failures and the complex fractures, they're displacement based. So when you're looking at these displacement based fractures, they don't open along the primary stress directions. They instead open at 45 degrees away from them. These complex fractures do not provide very much conductivity, which is to say that oil will not travel long distances among these, along these complex fractures. However, these fractures provide a lot of surface area. Not only do they provide surface area, but because they're based on displacement, they're not as vulnerable to closure during depletion. And in reality, all hydraulic fracture treatments create a combination of these tensile simple fractures and the com shear complex fractures. Let me just check the chat real quick. Um, all right. So, and this, and this is a very simplified summary of a, of a complex topic. And I'm just talking about a single well example here. But because the drive mechanism can't be altered in unconventional plays, the only thing you can do to increase how much oil you get out of the ground is to increase the size of the hydraulic fracture treatment in order to generate a larger effective stimulated rock volume. So when we have a larger hydraulic fracture treatment, because we have a larger stimulated rock volume that we're draining, we get more oil out of the ground. So over the last decade, hydraulic fracture treatments in the United States have gotten larger and larger simply because that's in some ways, the main way to increase your um, oil recovery. However, you also need to make sure that you're not just stimulating the rock, but you're effectively stimulating the rock. What does that mean? An effective simulated rock volume has to have a lot of complexity associated with it. Because if you do not have that complexity, you're not going to be draining the rock very well. On the left side, is kind of where hydraulic fractures started in the United States when we were doing large open hole treatments using gels. When we use those gels, we create large tensile failures and we create minimal complexity and the open hole also hurts, but we'll go into it. And then over time in the United States, we have gone to having, creating, trying to create as many tensile failures as possible and try to create as much complexity as possible associated with it. And as a result, uh, wells have significantly improved in the United States over time. Because like I said, you can't really do anything but create more effective stimulated rock volume to improve your recovery because the drive mechanism is always going to be the same otherwise. So what do I mean by effective stimulated rock volume? Uh, what that means is rock volume that has sufficient complexity to drain the matrix rock. So on the left side, we have two field examples. And in red, in those pictures, uh, the black lines are the well bores. So you see on field one, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wells in a wine rack pattern. On the bottom, we have one, two, three, four, I mean, just a lot of wells, like 15 or 16 wells, also in a wine rack pattern, but with even more uh, horizontal layers. Or uh, more wells vertically. 
So in red, you can see how far the rock was stimulated. This is the extent of the tensile failure and the entire stimulated rock volume for these patterns. And then these are real world examples. But then when we go to deplete it, on the top in purple, those are the depleted zones in the matrix. So you see that those depleted zones are smaller than the red zones. So this purple zone is the effective stimulate, stimulated rock volume where the wells generated enough complexity to drain. And on the bottom, you can see a similar pattern where the drainage volume is significantly less than the stimulated volume. And that's because that full extent includes those tensile failures, which don't really help us drain the rock in unconventional plays. So how did we go from more, less complexity to more complexity? Well, one of the big things is we realized the importance of limited entry when we're designing our well completions. When you're looking at an unconventional play, there's a huge number of heterogeneities that can be in the, in the, in the play. There's natural fractures, it can be false, there can be weakness planes, there, any number of things can be happening in the rock. And when we were drilling with vertical wells and you go straight through, you can drill a well without really hitting any of these natural heterogeneities. And then when you do an open hole completion with that vertical well, you don't particularly interact with any of them. So as a result, you're um, gonna be fine. However, when we started drilling horizontal wells, the horizontal well will hit every single heterogeneity in, in the rock. It'll just, I mean, you have a, that's what horizontal well is gonna do. And when we started, we did open hole completions and those open hole completions, if you're hydraulically fracturing a stage and there's any heterogeneity along that rock wall, the hydraulic fracture will take that heterogeneity and run with it. And so instead of creating a large number of tensile fractures or creating any complexity, all that's gonna happen is your hydraulic fracture is gonna follow that natural heterogeneity and take all the fluid for that stage. So over time, US companies have moved to more and more limited entry. And when you do a limited entry and you just perf a few holes in your cement, what ends up happening I mean, you, do, you drill your well, you cement it, and then you do plug and perf as opposed to open hole completion. And the chances of those perforations going directly into a natural heterogeneity are significantly reduced compared to an open hole completion. So it's a statistical game to some extent. So to repeat that, when we started in the United States, we did open hole completions, and those had completely uncontrolled access to the reservoir. So as a result, natural heterogeneities controlled how well a well would do, and it limited complexity, and it limited how many tensile failures each stage would generate. Companies switched to single point perf liners, sliding sleeves, and other things for a time, but those almost did nothing to reduce the issue because they still had a huge amount of rock face being exposed. And eventually, all US companies have moved to cemented liner sleeves and plug and perf uh, to have the most limited, to have limited entry into the reservoir. And a few companies are trying what we call ultra limited entry in which there's only a couple of perforations per stage uh, as in like two or three holes in the entire stage for the fluid, but that um, is still in testing. Let's say there are, there are issues we run into. The other thing companies have done to increase complexity is the away from linear gels to slick water. So when you have a linear gel or a cross-linked gel, it's going to act like a pretty big nail into the reservoir and create tends to create more bi-wing failures. Uh, when we talk about slick water, it's easier to inject uh, if we can inject large volumes of it compared to the gel while saving costs, 
and it has lower viscosity, so it tends to create more complex failures. Uh, now, the disadvantage of slick water is that it does tend to leak off more, but that's not necessarily the end of the world because if it leaks off into the reservoir, it's going to be displacing oil and then you get the oil, so it's not a huge deal. But yes, in essence, the two main things that the United States has learned is to generate more, I mean, the main thing the United States has learned is to generate as much complexity in their hydraulic factors as possible. And they do that by using more limited entry, moving away from open hole to plug and perf. And the other thing is moving away from gels to slick waters. Because like I've said, in US unconventionals, if you don't have significant natural fractures, complex hydraulic fractures are necessary to generate large effective SRVs. And there's a lot of other complexities in this conversation, but that's not really the point of this presentation. So how does that compare to tight oil, which is the reservoir that most of you uh, are more likely to deal with? Well, instead of having high initial pressures of 0.6 PSI per foot and above, uh, tight oil is normally pressured. 0.5 PSI per foot is probably your maximum you'll see. Um, in unconventional plays, oil, what we call black oil here, still has GORs easily above 1,000, while in tight oil, your GORs are going to be 800 and below typically. Uh, the one thing that tight oil has going forward, of course, is that instead of having incredibly low background permeability, you have okay permeability of 1 to 0 0.1 millidarcies. Uh, and in both tight oil and unconventional plays, you can have natural fracture systems that have significant impacts on how they behave. So the advantage for tight oil is that you don't need this huge complexity like you do in unconventional plays because your higher background permeability provides the same function as the complexity would in an unconventional, in an unconventional play. Um, so when we talk about tight oil drive mechanisms, uh, it is once again a solution gas drive, just like our unconventional oil. Uh, your permeability of 0.1 to 1 millidarcy, that's not enough for meaningful aquifer support. Uh, an initial gas cap might exist if your reservoir pressure is the same as your bubble point pressure. But once again, the permeability is so low that it's not necessarily going to be very helpful for you. And then on top of that, compared to unconventional oil, tight oil does not have characteristics that make it a good solution gas drive. Average initial pressure, oil can be heavy and waxy. The gap between your initial pressure and bubble point pressure in tight oil can be non-existent. Uh, critical gas saturation is going to be a conventional value, typically, you know, 3%. So the recovery factors for tight oil are just not good. The one advantage tight oil has over unconventional is that your drainage volume is not limited to your effective stimulated rock volume. And what I mean by that is that as long as you create a hydraulic fracture to give yourself economic well rates, you don't really care how far that hydraulic fracture extends into the reservoir because you have enough permeability naturally that's gonna drain your, your volume uh, no matter what. Uh, the downside, of course, is that the recovery factor is so low that even if you're draining a relatively large tank, it may not, you know, look great. So when we're talking about hydraulic fracturing goals, we don't really care so much about creating complexity in tight oil like we do with unconventionals. We mostly care about creating nice long tensile fractures. Now, that being said, you shouldn't be scared of complexity. Just because it's not necessarily a design goal doesn't mean it's gonna ruin you. Like with unconventional oil, if you hydraulically fracture a tight oil reservoir and you lose fluid through leak off into your matrix rock, that's 
water you lose is going to be displacing oil out of the matrix. So that's additional oil production. It's not, not the end of the world. Don't, don't be scared of leak off, I guess is my statement here. But at the same time, the real challenge is that the recovery factors are just low. Like you, you're not going to be able to just increase your oil recovery in a tight oil by making a larger hydraulic pressure treatment. You're, you're not, it doesn't work that way. So for tight oil, the size of your drainage volume per, per solution gas drive is not limited to your effective simulated rock volume. Your permeability is just high enough that it'll drain given time. And as long as you can make the well rate be economic with a sufficiently sized hydraulic pressure treatment. So yes, that's what it is. So let's go through some examples of tight oil in the United States. And uh, these are gonna be kind of grim. So this first example is a, about a uh, 0.3 millidarcy uh, reservoir with 36 to 40 API oil, 500 to 700 GOR, uh, an 11-stage slick water job with some gel, a pretty tight cluster spacing, though only part of the well is completed because they were having some issues while drilling it. In this particular case, the well peaks at 400 barrels per day of oil production. And you can see that the water cut stays extremely high in the 80s and 90s for the life of this well, though the gas rate stays pretty flat. Uh, now, the main one thing you can look at it and say, well, this is a pretty huge water cut, and, and that's right. But another thing you can say is that this rock is producing thousands and thousands of barrels of liquid production per day. So this is a pretty high liquid rate for a horizontal well in the United States. It's just unfortunately mostly water. Now, why is it mostly water? If we look at the matrix water saturation distribution, you see that the water saturations are fairly high in this reservoir, an average of 65% water. But that's not the end of it. On top of that, when they drilled the well, here you have the initial water saturation on the right side, and then in black you have the reservoir. They drilled this well through this high water saturation zone. <laughs> I'm sorry, can somebody mute themselves? Thank you. Uh, I say a question in the comments. Uh, no, uh, water flooding cannot be carried out on conventional place. Uh, water flooding in general does not work. Um, sorry. So let's go back up here. And then if you look at the permeability of the rock, it's fairly decent for the United States, you know, 0.35 millidarcy. So it looks like what they did was they targeted this high permeability zone from their data, but at the same time, they ended up targeting a high water saturation zone as well. So they ended up producing 80% water. Now, if we look at how does the frac geometry look like, on the left side here, we have the tensile component of their hydraulic fracture treatment. So this is the extent of their tensile failure mode. Here in the middle, we have the complexity they generated. And as you can see, the complexity was much smaller than their tensile component. And if we look at how the res reservoir matrix rock was depleted, the high complexity zone is where you see the deepest depletion, but because the background permeability is high enough, in general, I'd say this is a pretty uh, even depletion of the matrix rock. So when we look at the pressure at the end of the history match, you have this high depletion zone, right where they drilled the well and created the most complexity. And it just so happens that's where they have the most water saturation. 
So as a result, they got their 80% water cut. I don't know why this company drilled a well into a high water zone, except like I said, my previous guess that they just saw the high perm streak and went for it. So what we learned from this example is that when you're doing a well, a tight oil well, and you have high water saturation and low water saturation zones, don't drill the well into the high water saturation zone. Um, and the other thing we learned here, well, not here, we've learned this before, but this is an example of it, is that when you hydraulically fracture, there is no net to gross. Net to gross is a concept that does not exist when you start hydraulic fracturing, because once you hydraulically fracture a rock, it, the hydraulic fracture doesn't know, it doesn't care that a geologist labeled it as not net. All right. So if you have a high water cut water zone with low permeability and you frack into it, that water is going to be produced. Not only is it going to be produced, but because these water bearing zones have a small amount of oil in them, 10 to 20% oil saturation, that oil will expand and it will flood more water into your well bore. So you have to be careful about where you land your zone and you have to be careful of what you hydraulically fracture into. Because if you hydraulically fracture into water, you will get that water. Okay, example number two. So example number two, this is... Could you display the log, log characteristics for the first example to be uh, 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 aware what is the heterogeneity in, in level of logging rather than level of simulation? It is also, it is uh, uh, more effective if you highlighted the log characteristics, open hole logs, was uh, 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 issue, uh, 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 open hole logs uh, in first, and after that was issue, and young loss. It will help us to see what is the degree of heterogeneity within your wells. Uh, I'm not allowed to share the logs from this reservoir. A, this isn't my data. This is client data that I cleaned up. Uh, B, these water saturations are just, just taken directly from the log. I, I mean, from what the data they sent us. So I'm sorry, I'm not a geo guy like that. I'll make a note for it for the future. Okay, number two, similar permeability to the previous case, but there's now natural fractures going through this system, huge, natural faulting fractures. And this company, well, you'll see. And they also did open hole completions. So those natural fractures ended up being, ended up controlling how these wells fractured. Here's a distribution of the water saturation in a slice of the model that is this, this slice is not along one of the natural fractures. This is a slice between the natural fractures. So on the left side, this is after they hydraulically fracture the well, and you can see in blue the extent of the water movement in the well, in the wells. And this was a five well section across three landing zones. Then after six months of productions, and then after 24 months of production. So you can see that there's water that's creeping out, but in this not fault layer of the model, it's relatively contained by zone. Here is what a fault looks like in the same situation or a large natural fracture that's going through the entire model. Right after hydraulically fracturing, everything is full of water because like I said, these natural fractures take all the water when you hydraulically fracture, take most of the water. But then six months and 24 months of production or 24 months of production, you see that there's segregation. Oil and gas is in the top of this fracture and water is at the bottom. How that looks like in terms of production, is that the bottom wells 
they were chugging 100% water and produced no oil 10 months after this well came online. All right. The top well, however, did manage to slowly reduce its water cut over time and produce some oil. In this case, should they have ever bothered drilling these bottom wells? Uh, no. So for this one, it's less about tight oil and more that when you have these high conductivity conduits, you have to really think carefully about how you're going to develop and this applies to tight oil or unconventionals. And you might want to not just hydraulically spend a huge amount of money hydraulically fracturing these wells, since those natural conduits are going to be driving your production anyway. And you probably don't want to drill the deeper wells in these sorts of formations because they're just going to end up chugging water. So yeah, when, when, you, when you find you have large natural fracture networks, you have to take that into account. And this company never took it into account. They just bought a bunch of land, they drilled as many wells as they could, and then six months later, they realized they're bankrupt. That's the story of this company. All right, uh, let's talk about EOR. So Huff and Puff EOR is the main EOR methodology we use in the United States unconventional plays. And we do this because displacement mechanisms don't work in unconventional plays. And I don't think they'll work in tight oil either. So the way Huff and Puff works is we inject gas into the well bore. The gas travels through our tensile failures and our complex failures. And that's how it gets into the matrix rock. Now, inside the matrix rock, we have our initial 100% oil, let's say, matrix rock. We deplete it. And then we have a gas and oil in our reservoir. We repressurize it. So some gas gets back into the oil, but not all of it. We can't ever really get all of it when we inject gas. And then we redeplete it. And every time we repeat this cycle, a little more incremental oil comes out. And that's how half and puff EOR works, uh, very simplistically. And then we can also look at this using uh, the common black oil PVT properties tables uh, or pictures in order to see how this process set up looking at this, these simple pictures, uh, simple PVT properties. So here's an initial black oil fluid sample. And we have our uh, solution gas oil ratio. So it starts at I mean, at zero pressure, the oil will be completely dead, so zero R sub S. We go to our initial GOR at the bubble point pressure and then stays flat after that. We have our B sub O, which peaks at the bubble point pressure. And we have our viscosity of oil, which peaks at our bubble point pressure. So when we go through, our, say this is the initial pressure of this reservoir in these red dotted lines, we deplete to the bubble point pressure, then we keep deepening below the bubble point pressure. So our GOR, solution GOR goes down, our B sub O goes down, and our viscosity of oil goes down. And the combination of the gas expansion and the oil expansion is what uh, drives the oil recovery. When we start injecting gas, we go from this depleted oil and we inject back up. And in this example, I'm just inject, I'm saying that the bottom hole pressure limit on our injection is going to be our initial pressure. And so we re-inject it and we go beyond, in this particular example, the properties of the oil at discovery because we can inject more gas than what was available to the reservoir initially. So we can keep going, increasing the solution gas oil ratio. So our B sub O goes down, goes up, our viscosity of oil goes way down, and it especially goes down compared to where it was when the, uh, the reservoir was depleted. And then we deplete again, and we get more oil out. So that's Huff and Puff EOR, is we uh, revive the oil, produce it, revive the oil, produce it, revive the oil, produce it. And in this case, this is a very simplistic picture. And one of the things that happens over time, and this is the solution gas oil ratio plot, is that because every time you cycle the gas, you're lifting the lighter components out of the oil, the remaining oil in the ground tends to be the heavier and heavier components. 
you're basically stripping the lighter components out of the oil. So the remaining components in the oil mix more and more poorly with the gas you're injecting. So it's not like you're following these plots up and down. It's a hysteretic process where you're slowly reducing the quality of the oil left in the ground and the quantity of the oil left in the ground. So the combination of remaining oil in place decreasing and the growing ineffectiveness of mixing eventually stops the project by economic limit. You do need sufficient containment to build pressure. And this is a black oil example that I just used for simplicity, but multiple reservoir fluids have been economically developed in the United States by Huff and Puff in unconventional place. And this is an example from the Eagle Third of um, how that works out. Now in this Eagle Third play, you can't do displacement based EOR uh, in blue here is the natural heterogeneities in this reservoir. And if you do a water flood, all that'll happen is that the water will flood through those heterogeneities and it won't displace any oil, period. You can't use it. However, when we use this mixing methodology, you still do have some containment issues, but the containment issues don't instantly kill your project. Instead, you just have to manage how much uh, gas escapes the well. I mean, escapes the place you want to do the hop and puff, but that can be manageable. And as a result, uh, you can do hop and puff. And in red here is the oil rate during the hop and puff of this particular well in the best optimized scenario. And then in the different colors, there's other scenarios we ran to compare it to in terms of how much gas you inject, how much do you weigh, uh, just, just detail work. But the point is you can get a lot of extra oil out of the ground with Huff and Puff and it works. So how can Huff and Puff work for tight oil EOR? Well, uh, the big drawback of tight oil is your low initial energy. Like I said, the depletion drive does not work very well in tight oil. The advantage you have though, is that you do have, you don't need complexity like unconventional place because you have enough background permeability. And your hydraulic fractures in tight oil can generate all the productivity you need to inject at high rates. Uh, though tight oils tend to be waxier and heavy oils. So when you have pressure depletion, the permeability doesn't just go from five to two or from two to five. I've seen tight oil where the permeability goes from two, sorry, the viscosity of the oil goes from two at the bubble point pressure to 20 at their uh, pressure limit. So you have significant viscosity drops in tight, you can have significant viscosity drops in tight oil. When you huff and puff, you revive the oil and get that viscosity back up to reasonable values. Uh, it's not a displacement process. So heterogeneities in your tight oil uh, don't kill your project immediately like they would with the displacement process. Instead, you just have to manage your injection in order to make sure you get enough into the matrix rock around your well bore. Um, and then a huge advantage to tight oil reservoirs abroad is that since you're not overpressured and you're not so deep, your compressor costs are much lower than they would be in the United States. In the United States, they need compressors that go to 10,000 pounds and can inject 25 million uh, cubic feet of gas a day. Uh, abroad, you guys don't need that. You only need whatever the pressure of your reservoir is, and you need only several million uh, cubic feet a day, not tens of millions of cubic feet per day. And the main reason I think uh, Hop and puff EOR would, be, would work great in tight oil is there's really not any choice. Um, like I said, displacement processes will never work very well because any natural heterogeneities will take that fluid and just run it to another well bore and it won't displace anything. With hop and puff, uh, yeah. And then your natural drive, your solution gas drive results in a very low recovery factor. So you end up with a lot of oil left in the ground. So in some ways you're forced into hop and puff if it's possible in your reservoir, 
because you just need to get additional oil out of the ground to make the wells to make your fields economic or to produce additional oil because you just don't have the energy to do otherwise. Uh, to go back to this point about slick water, a lot of tight oil developers abroad avoid slick water because they're worried about leak off. They're worried about not gener they're worried about not generating enough productivity, not placing their propent. But the reality is that it's fairly easy to get enough hydraulic fractures going to make your well have economic rates. And simply having a hydraulic fracture treatment be larger and more effective just to get higher rates doesn't help you if ultimately the well doesn't produce very much oil. When you do slick water and you have some leak off, if the water gets into your reservoir and displaces some oil just during that hydraulic fracturing process, it's not the end of the world. It might be a little bit more oil in the beginning. I'm also not certain that this is necessarily a useful way of getting more oil out of the ground, but I've just noticed abroad, there's a lot of hesitancy with slick water. And I just don't think it's something people should be scared of because leak off isn't the end of the world. Um, so just a few disclaimers. Uh, the world is huge. There's Every tight oil play is different. Every unconventional play is different. I needed, I was asked to do a 45 minute presentation on something. So I tried to do this topic because I thought it would be interesting for a Middle Eastern audience, but I can't go into the full details and complexity of every single element of this. Um, and I can't show every possible scenario. I'm just trying to share some thoughts and considerations. All right, questions. Uh, I hope. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That was engineer. exactly forty-five uh, minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Engineer Vladimir. Uh, we have some questions. Um, um, we have the first question in that. Uh, how is half and buff EUR different from WAG EUR? Okay, uh, so uh, WAG EOR is still a displacement process in which they inject CO2 and water into injection wells and then produce oil out of production wells. And the main thing about WAG is that ideally those reservoirs would be injecting 100% CO2 but since they didn't have enough CO2 available, they also injected water. But typically when we look at WAG cases, the more CO2 they would have injected and the less water, the better they do. And the other difference is that with Huff and Puff, you inject into, well, I guess WAG doesn't have to use CO2, just the WAG cases I've seen have CO2 in them. But in any case, it's always a gas limitation and it's a displacement process. With uh, Huff and Puff, you are injecting and producing out of a single well. And since you're injecting and producing out of a single well, you're not relying on displacement. All you're relying on is the gas mixing with the oil and then coming back to you. So you don't, so it's not a displacement. So I guess the main difference is, Displacement process versus mixing process. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, could you tell us what is the main matrix rook at the first and second examples? Is it chill rook? So he asking about the uh, rook type in the first and the second examples. Sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, okay. So for this question, he does. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I believe this first one is a uh, sandstone, sandstone-ish, and the second one is uh, carbonate-ish. Okay. Thank you. 
So any additional question? So for the video of our webinar, it will be uploaded in the, our YouTube channel and also already the link for our YouTube channel was sent into the Zoom chat, okay? Uh, so I think that we don't have any additional question. Thank you, Engineer Vladimir, for this interesting, uh, interesting webinar uh, and also uh, for this interesting presentation or add some new items for the technical background for our attendees. Uh, and also thank you everyone to attend our webinar for today. Uh, please, uh, do, uh, please remember to fill into the certification form that was sent into the Zoom chat in case that you want to get a certificate for this uh, webinar. And also in case that you want to enroll into our course of production optimization, the link will be sent into the Zoom chat now, again, thank you for you, uh, for you, Engineer Vladimir, for this interesting webinar. Uh, hope you guys got something out of it. I realize it was a lot. Thank you.